All right, welcome back, everybody. It's been a nice, relaxing week, hopefully for all of you. I know a lot of you had exams, um, and uh, and it wasn't necessarily relaxing, but hopefully less stressful than it would have been otherwise. Hopefully you were able to get caught up a little bit at least. Uh, but now it's back into the thick of it. Let's move on with WebSockets. And the homework is posted for this section for these two weeks. Uh, for the next two weeks of lectures, I'm going to teach you how to do homework four. So let's talk about what homework four is. It's all about WebSockets. And uh, I just said this before lecture, but just so this makes the YouTube video, I, I don't believe there's another difficulty spike in the course quite like the jump from homework two to homework three. If you're able to complete homework three, I know a lot of you are still working on it, but if you're able to complete homework three by Friday, I'm confident that you're going to do well in this course. Well, homework four and homework five, they, you know, objectively may, might be a little bit more difficult than homework three. They might even be a little easier. It's hard for me to tell. It's just different, uh, different types of difficulty. Uh, but they're definitely not significantly more difficult than homework three. If you're able to get homework three, you're going to be able to finish this course and do well in this course. So not to not to celebrate, you know, don't celebrate early and just uh, stop putting in effort. But if the same effort that you put in for homework three, you put those in for homework four and five, I think you'll be good. Uh, and I designed the course like that. Homeworks one and two kind of ease you into the course. Homework three says, this is what the course actually is. This is the level that I need you to be at. And then homework four and five just level off and say, okay, now that we're at that level, let's keep going at that level. So with that said, homework four, WebSockets, we're going to create a connection using WebSockets with our clients. This way we can send communication to our clients. So far with HTTP, we have no way of sending information to our clients. Our users are sitting there in the dark until they send us a request and then we respond with a response. Uh, but that doesn't quite give us everything that we want in a web app. What we really want with, uh, depending on the app of course, but what we really want in a lot of apps is real time communication between users. For example, chat, if you're in watching this on Twitch right now live, in chat that uses WebSockets, somebody, anybody types a message in chat and everybody gets to see that message immediately without having to refresh the page or send another HTTP request. It's just being sent over that WebSocket connection that already exists. And that's what we wanna talk about for the next two weeks or at least the next four lectures. And then we'll talk about databases as well. So we'll have a form on our page. You're welcome to take my sample HTML and JavaScript. As always, you can make changes to it as long as you don't fundamentally change what we're doing in this uh, in this project. Uh, but as long as you have two text fields or two inputs, they don't even have to be text really, and a button that calls some JavaScript that uses WebSockets, that's fine. You can change this if you want to make something different, if you want to personalize your homework project and make it your own and make it an app that really does something, uh, feel free. For, for my examples in the homework doc itself, it's just going to be a basic chat app where you get to put it, enter your own name. So there's no authentication yet. That's a homework five thing. Uh, users get to enter their own name, whatever they choose, and their comment, and then submit comments at their will. This needs to work with WebSockets. So how do we do WebSockets? Uh, this is going to happen in three, no, well, two, I guess, two steps, which uh, which we're going to learn handshakes, objective one today, and then frames, socket frames, web socket frames on Wednesday. So objective one, the web socket handshake. First in the browser, in your JavaScript for your browser, this line is going to make a web socket connection with a server. On the browser side, there's not much to do, and I give you the code to, to do the, the browser side. There's not much to do here. Because the browser has built-in functionality for WebSockets, and in this course, we're not rebuilding a browser from scratch, starting with the TCP connection, TCP client connection. We're building a web server from scratch with a TCP web, uh, a TCP server connection. So uh, we're gonna let the browser do the work for us on the browser side. 
We're just going to create a new WebSocket, which all major browsers support, and give it a URL starting with WS for WebSocket as the protocol. Give it a host, which I'm going to use the default, or not the default host, but the host. I'm accessing the host that sent this request. So wh wherever we got the original HTD, uh, HTML from, that's going to be this host. And then a path, we're going to use the path slash WebSocket. This is actually going to make an HTTP request to the path WebSocket that's going to initialize a WebSocket connection. With this line, the browser is going to send that HTTP request following the protocol, doing everything that we expect it to do. And it's up to you on the server to follow what's called the WebSocket handshake to be able to establish that WebSocket connection, starting with that HTTP request. This all starts with HTTP still. Once you have a connection established, we're going to add some JavaScript to be able to use that connection. Again, you're welcome to change this any way you want. I have this set up as a chat app. If you want to do something else for your homework, be my guest. Uh, I would love to see some personalized sites, personally. I, I think it'd be great. But if you don't want to think about that, if you are you just want to get through the homework, feel free to use my sample code here and just build this as a chat app with username and message. So now that we have the connection, on the client side, we can set this up to send and receive messages. So to send messages, I'll go a little bit out of order here. To send messages, we're going to build a JSON string. And I'm getting the information from the HTML elements, the inputs. And then we're going to do socket, which is the socket that we connected with. Socket.send. Oh, I should have my logged in right here. That should be const. Don't capitalize that for me. Uh, it doesn't have to be const. It's fine either way. Uh, I like it to be const. So we're going to... Uh, use socket it has a send method it takes a string and that's going to be sent it's going to be uh, converted to a web socket frame which we're going to have to parse on the server side it's going to send that web socket frame containing this payload this information this string in this case and our server is going to have to parse that and do what it does with that we can also receive messages using this on message variable. This takes a function or is of type function rather. So we're going to set this to a function. This function is going to be called whenever a message is received over the WebSocket connection. And for that, uh, it's going to get an argument, which is the message that's being sent. And I'm going to parse that message. It's going to be in the same format of the messages that we're sending. For my example, again, if you want to change the format, you don't want to use JSON, be my guest, um, and change this around for your homework. But I'm going to parse that message. I'm going to find my div for the chat. And I'm going to add that HTML just by appending to enter HTML. Nothing fancy here. We're just going to append to enter HTML and add that message to the end of it. So our goal, your goal, is to build the server side of this, of both receiving and sending messages over this WebSocket connection. Uh, this is mostly Wednesday's topic, and then Friday and next Monday we'll reinforce today and Wednesday's lectures. We'll make sure everybody's on the same page, especially with the concurrency stuff. Uh, that can get tricky, and it's also language specific, so it's hard to cover in, in lecture. I might just go over Python and JavaScript, how to do it in those two languages, uh, since that covers the majority of the class. But we'll see. I, I'll have to... Maybe I'll look at the homework three submissions once they come in and see if, um, if there's been a lot of language switching by then uh, and make a decision then. So... For this objective, you need to receive those messages that are sent Erlang. If you choose Erlang, you're on your own. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm giving you zero support. Uh, if you choose Erlang, presumably you understand everything. Like you, you're a god programmer at that point. Like just uh, 
you don't need any help. So receiving messages from a client, parsing the message, getting the actual information out of it, and then sending that information to all connected clients, broadcast that to everybody that's connected to the chat. And that should be our live chat. Objective two is for first of all, objective two, there's a lot uh, there's a lot here. Objective two is going to be difficult. And objective two, by the time you're done with this, you will have live real-time chat built starting from a TCP socket. This is a big accomplishment when you get done with objective two. Uh, we do have the concern of HTML injection, so you have to be escaping your HTML. And be aware, this will make more sense on Wednesday, but this will change your payload size. So this does get a little bit tricky. Uh, objective three, whenever a new WebSocket connects, now we're just going to add more features. Whenever a new WebSocket connects, a new client connects and joins the chat, send them all the chat history. You can send each message, and you should, send each mes message as a separate WebSocket frame or, uh, or message, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, send each one as a separate frame, but you do have to remember all the history and then send that to new connections, newly connected clients. So then instead of having, like, this is live chat, but you don't get to see any chat history, here we're going to get the chat history whenever somebody new logs on to your app or, or uh, uh, we don't have log on yet. But, um, but whenever somebody opens your, goes to your site, go, enters... Jeez, I'm losing my words here. Um, whenever somebody goes to your app, uses your app, and first opens the page, they should see all the chat history. I feel like you know what I'm saying, but I'm having trouble getting the words there. Uh, and then, finally, databases, the last two lectures of this, uh, of this section of the course, is going to be adding a database and having the chat history persist across a server restart. For that, we're going to use Docker Compose, which is going to let us combine multiple Docker containers where we'll have, we'll have our database running in one container and then the web server running in another container. And those two containers will communicate with each other to be able to build one full app experience that spans multiple containers. Uh, and the bonus objective, I got to warn you, I have my warning right here. This bonus objective is difficult. Like the assignment itself, of course, isn't easy, but this bonus objective, this is a true bonus objective. If you're if you're comfortable with the everything in this course and you're really enjoying it, you're really learning a lot, and you're ready for a bigger challenge, here it is. Here's your bigger challenge. Images in chat over WebSocket connections. So build that functionality from homework two but build it using web sockets and have images sent over those sockets and then images uh, I got to think about that a little bit. Uh, actually, you shouldn't be serving the images over the web sockets. I'll update this a little bit, but the images should be uploaded via web sockets. And then uh, then the web socket should send image tags and then the downloads for the images can be separate. And that's homework four. There is there is a big bump in homework uh, in objective two from objective one, in my opinion. Now, you, you might not even experience that big bump. But in my opinion, objective one is, uh, isn't too difficult. And then objective two is getting into like the, the core of the assignment. Objective two really is the core of WebSockets. This is the by far the most important objective here. And then objective three is adding a feature to it. This one honestly isn't too bad, especially after you complete two. It's a little bit downhill from here. And then objective four, since you're dealing with Docker Compose in databases, uh, this can either be really easy, simple, and fast, or you can have a big debugging process and have it take hours and hours and even days. Uh, just, just like the same thing I said with Docker to begin with, Either it's going to work and it's going to just be great, or you're going to have a lot of really painful debugging to do. Those of you who watched last week know that I was even debugging 
uh, for quite a while the database when I was using Docker Compose. I think I'm going to push you all towards, um, geez, um, towards MongoDB because I just in my own experience using MySQL with Docker Compose, I'm going to cover MySQL and um, MongoDB. Doing MySQL and Docker Compose just seems to give me a lot more errors and a lot more debugging time than MongoDB. MongoDB kind of just, just works a lot easier. Uh, maybe that's just something I'm doing wrong. I don't know, but I don't want to lead you into that same hole that I keep in. Uh, but I feel like at least twice now, I've gone through really long debug processes with MySQL and Docker Compose, and I've never done that with my uh, with MongoDB. MongoDB seems to work a lot easier. Problem with MySQL is in, in Docker, at least, it just doesn't want to give me any error messages. It just says it didn't work. Good luck trying to figure that out. I'm like, thanks. You didn't even start homework three? Yeah, Jory, you, you're... I mean, we're already done with all of the homework three content. Uh, we've been done with it all for a week now. Y you should have started by now. <laughs> it's I don't know what else to say. I mean, you have till Friday, so you can definitely do it. But you know, that's a that's a pretty big hole to dig out of. You regret not doing the homeworks in Go. I think someday this whole course should be Go. I might require Go, but that would take. I don't know, at least a summer break. The absolute earliest that would happen is uh, next semester in the fall. And even then, I don't think that's going to happen. I think it'll be choose your language for a while. If not forever. No, the bonus isn't worth more. It's The bonus is, I mean, if you can complete that bonus, let's be real, you're getting an A in this course. Like, there's no way you can do that bonus and then mess up enough somewhere else in the course that you're not going to get an A. Like, you, you shouldn't be worried about your grade if you're capable of completing that bonus. Um, and why would you skip? The only reason you'd want more points is so you can skip something later. But if you're the type of student who's taken on an optional, difficult objective, probably the type of student who wants to do everything and learn the most you can anyway, so... I wouldn't even see the point of making it worth more points. Did I put an A in YAML? Let me fix that. I did not. Oh, I did. How did they not find it the first time? You just saw me do a search. Probably because of the way... Because I have to use uh, Google search. Instead of the browser search. Probably the way this is built. I believe this is all one big... Uh, JavaScript... Canvas, maybe? I don't know. But it, it doesn't play well with the browser. Oh. Okay, never mind. I don't know what happened there. But yeah, it's supposed to be YML, pronounced YAML. But sometimes I'm just typing the way I say it, and uh, and I mess it up. All right, well, let's start learning how to do this damn homework. Yeah, make sure there's no more questions. Once you learn SQL, MongoDB, can you use those without writing? Yes, uh, so you don't have to, for the project, SQL, MySQL, and MongoDB, or uh, or whatever you use for a database, which is required to be in Docker Compose, uh, you don't have to write a report for, for the group project. Anything, and in general, anything that's allowed on your homework, you don't have to write a report for. So MySQL, MongoDB, you don't have to write, okay, this is what SQL is, this is controlling my file I.O. for me, it's more efficient, this is how it does it. This is how we connect to it with a TCP connect. Nah, you, let's not. Uh, I don't see the benefit of that. Uh, we can just use those as uh, as is and just say this is software that we're going to use. Uh, it's a little off the beat. So here's my my uh, my idea behind that is we have courses, multiple courses in the department about databases. I'm going to leave that stuff to them. Those courses. 
when it comes to web development stuff, that's where you're going to have to write reports for. When it's specifically about the content of this course, uh, SQL, MongoDB, any databases, is just a little bit too far away from what we're talking about in this course in 312. Uh, I'm going to leave that to, to other people. Just like TCP and IP, that's getting a little too far away from what we're doing in this course. So I'm going to leave that to modern networking concepts. We have a course that already covers all that. If you're interested in that, uh, you know, there's still an outlet for you to be able to learn that stuff. Uh, but especially when there's something that's not covered, like HTTP isn't really covered in any course. So everything HTTP, that's important. That you're going to have to write reports for. You're going to have to uh, really uh, do those things in that co this course. Uh, WebSockets, likewise. What would the bonus for homework five look like then? I don't know what the bonus will look like for homework five. Yet. I haven't really I haven't thought that far ahead yet. Homework five, it's storing passwords will be an objective uh, building the adding the paths for the register and login uh, parts of your app and then locking down pages based on whether you're logged in or not maybe the bonus would be different um, different levels of authentication maybe an admin user um, maybe a moderator and a regular user maybe that would be the bonus for homework five is probably where I'll end up going with that Your debugging skills have tripled. Yeah, ha hashing and storing passwords, that'll probably be like objective one of homework five. And the rest is building the, uh, um, building the whole authentication thing. Uh, cookies is part of homework five. There's quite a bit stuffed into homework five. That's why databases we're doing at the end. It's kind of tacked on to the end of WebSockets. It's so you already have your database set up going into homework five. So objective one, when I'm like hash and store, you know, write the functionality to hash and store passwords, you already have your database connection all set up and uh, and you can focus on the security and authentication aspects of homework five. Because we got to learn cookies. Uh, we got to learn uh, pathing based on those cookies. I don't know, I guess I'll save that for homework five. Let's get on with it. We don't have too many slides today. That's why I spent so much time introducing the homework and reading chat. Uh, but let's get into this content. Let's go through these slides. So uh, we talked about Ajax last time, uh, a, like a week and a half ago now. Uh, we talked about Ajax where we can re make requests to the server after the page loads. This is, oh yeah, some juicy content today. Uh, we're going to make WebSocket connections today, that WebSocket handshake. So... Uh, we saw Ajax requests where you can request, make HTTP requests after the page loads, which is required. Like we have to do that at some point if we want interactive sites. We want our users to connect to our site, the whole page loads, and then we want them communicating with each other after the page loads. So we have to have communication with the server after the page load loaded. And polling is uh, so far the only way we've seen to do that with Ajax or Ajax requests in general where we can make an HTTP request and then get the information back and then render that information to the page, to the user. And then we had polling, which is making these Ajax requests for new content at regular intervals. So say every second, we're gonna send a request to the server and say, hey, do you have new information for me? And then the server responds like with, yeah, here's more information or no, I got none for you right now. This is okay, but it introduces delays uh, if you have to wait up to a second for for anything to happen in a chat app, yeah, it's a little annoying. For real-time gaming, that's completely out of the question. We can't do that. Uh, if you have to wait like every second, you have one second frame rate, um, a frame rate of one, uh, that's going to be ridiculous. And then you can decrease your polling time. Maybe you want to pull every 10, uh, 10 times a second to get a better frame rate and get better responsiveness. Well, now you have a lot of network traffic. You have a lot of requests to handle. It's just a lot of waste. Uh, it, it's a very expensive feature to build just by decreasing your polling. So what apps used to do, what developers used to do is go to long polling, and some still do. Go to long polling where instead of making a request every at a fixed interval, you make a request, and then the server just sits there and waits until it has something to send. And then once it has something to send back, 
it'll respond to that long pull request. So this, this is uh, better than pulling because it's quick responses. But again, there are downsides to this. For one, if you have, uh, say you do want 30 updates per second, you still have this problem of a lot of network traffic. You need a new HTTP request and HTTP response for every long pull. And if the server's constantly saying, yep, I got information for you, yep, I got information for you, yep, I got information for you, that's long pull request response, long pull request response. It's going to turn into polling. It's going to have the same downsides. The only benefit is when there's not any action going on, the long polling does reduce that network traffic. The network traffic only occurs, an extra load only occurs when there's data to send to the client. But we want a better way. Uh, that's why I don't even have these on a homework polling and long polling. Uh, we're going to skip right to a, a more modern solution. That modern, more modern solution is WebSockets. And there are new protocols coming out that are trying to... Oh, the fire alarm going off. Good luck. Uh, that That's rough. Uh, so there's uh, mo there are more modern protocols coming out. Uh, uh, but Web WebSockets is... We know it's supported by all the browsers because it's been around a while. And it'll take the new protocols a while to get adopted by all of the major browsers. And then getting all users to update their browsers, it's going to take a while. Uh, just like it took WebSockets a long time to be adopted. Usually, you you know, back not too long ago, you couldn't rely on your clients using WebSockets because if somebody doesn't update their browser and they uh, installed their browser before WebSockets were a thing, well, they can't use your site if you rely on WebSockets. So at the very least, sites would have a fallback of long polling if a browser didn't support WebSockets. So with the new protocols, we'll have the same issues for a while. And then eventually, you know, I'll teach one of the newer ones in this class because it'll be widely adopted. Uh, uh, so for now, WebSockets, and honestly, I don't I don't see why WebSockets needs improving. It's uh, it's perfectly fine. Um, uh, you can't, can't really do much better? I don't know. Maybe that's a naive thing to say. But what WebSockets gets us is two-way communication between the client and server. That's what we want. More, Most specifically, the server pushes. The server has data. The server can immediately send information to the client. WebSockets are a layer above the transport layer. Oh, I forget the layer names, but it's at the same level of HTTP. It's an application. It's an application layer. Uh, it, it's... You can think of it the same uh, same level as HTTP. Transport. Transport's like TCP, right? I believe. Yeah, it'd be right above the transport layer if that's TCP and UDP. Pretty sure that's the transport layer, right? I should know. I know. You can make fun of me if you want. But, um, uh, but if you want to learn more about the network stack, my networking concepts, all about the network stack. Could interrupts be at all possible? What do you mean by that? I right, think thanks, thanks to Cardis. Yeah, it's uh, above the transport layer then at the application layer. Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, so I had it right. I just should have said it with more confidence and been like, "Yep, that's that's the case." <laughs> and you wouldn't know. I I was a little shaky. I was like ninety five percent sure, but I hedged my bet. So now we have. The ability to have server pushes. The server has information. The server can immediately send that information to the client without any extra requests from the client, without any extra network traffic either. So how do we do this? Well, it's pretty simple in, in the, the theory, the design of this is when we get an HTTP request, that request was sent over a TCP socket. And then with HTTP, we send the HTTP request the client sends the request, we send the response, and we close that TCP connection. Well, WebSockets say, let's just keep that TCP connection open and keep talking over this TCP connection. TCP is already a protocol that allows two-way communication. I mean, you sent me a request, I sent you a response. We have two-way communication. We can communicate bytes in both directions. Why don't we just... Leave that connection open. And that's what WebSockets are. We're going to leave that TCP connection open and continuously send information back and forth over that TCP connection. Security issues. Uh, there are, as with all things on the internet, there are. Uh, I, 
might get into them. I don't know if we'll get into them on on homework five. Actually, that might be the bonus in homework five is you doing uh, authentication over WebSockets. So one question is, how do we authenticate a WebSocket? This is getting a little head. I'll, I'll take a little side trip into this. Is when we have a WebSocket connection, it starts with an... Actually, I didn't even explain how WebSockets work. Let me explain this, and then I'll answer that question, Jory. I'll give you a, a, one, a, one concern, at least, that we have with WebSockets. So with the WebSocket protocol, we're, we're establishing a TCP connection, right? I'll, I'll walk you through this whole thing. Client says, hey, I want a TCP connection with this server on either port 80 or 443. And say, look, I want a TCP connection. We go through the three-way handshake for TCP and create that TCP connection. Then the client sends an HTTP request. And that request, instead of saying, hey, here's a request, I want a response. And well, look, I guess it kind of does still do that. But instead of requesting information or posting information with a GET or POST request, this is going to be a request for a protocol upgrade. So the HTTP request is going to say, hey, this TCP connection that we established, I want this to be a WebSocket connection. The server is going to be like, game on, let's do it. This TCP connection that we have, which we initially set up as an HTTP connection, let's start talking WebSockets on this TCP connection. We keep that connection open until either client or server closes the connection. Uh, the client might close their browser tab. The server might crash or... Or you might time out a user if they've been idle for too long. Uh, but we're going to keep that TCP connection open. And we're going to keep sending messages back and forth over this connection. So the client can send messages to the server at any time, which they could already do with Ajax. But now the server, importantly, the server can send information to the client at any time, which is a brand new feature. This is something that we could only really get through long polling uh, before which long pulling is, you know, gross at best, I guess. Uh, it's, it's a fine solution. It's a great solution for the time. But now that WebSockets exist, let's just use WebSockets. So we have a persistent connection. We send information back and forth. So one of the security issues is if you're, uh, is how do you authenticate in a, a WebSocket connection? So with a regular HTTP request, you'll have cookies attached to it that say, hey, I'm logged in. Here's, uh, here's my token to prove that I'm logged in. With WebSockets, uh, there's a question of how to authenticate these. So with the initial HTTP request, you can attach those tokens. Those cookies will exist, and you can authenticate that connection. But after the connection is established, there's a question of do you reauthenticate the WebSocket connection at any time, or do you just assume for the life of that WebSocket connection that it is that user? And what if you have a WebSocket connection? It's authenticated through the HTTP request. You have this connection that's open, and then the user logs out. How do you make sure that that TCP connection also logs out? And that the next person to sit down at that machine, maybe they're at a, a public uh, at a library on campus, the next person to sit down at that machine doesn't have those have that connection open still. Uh, so there are some concerns there of how do we authenticate the WebSockets? Or do we authenticate every single WebSocket message? But what if the client isn't sending us messages and we're only pushing messages? Uh, do we request their authentication cookies at regular intervals? There's a lot of uh, a lot of questions with that. He hijack a connection. I mean, it's not it's not not really. But if somebody has access to your machine, like if somebody uses your laptop after you, if somebody has physical access to your device, uh, which at that point, I mean, all security kind of goes out the window anyway. But if you're using a public machine, you use a machine at work or at school or something. Uh, if that connection isn't severed when you log out, that can be a big deal. So uh, so there are ways to handle that when you log out. When somebody logs out, make sure you go to all their WebSocket connections or connection and uh, and sever that connection. Make sure that that's, uh, that's close to. But that's one of the things that, one of the security aspects we got to think of with, 
uh, with WebSockets is when we're authenticated. When we have an authenticated user, how do we make sure that they're properly authenticated over a WebSocket connection? And time to live restrictions, but it's not perfect. Like if, uh, like the question of how, when, like how long do you allow that connection to stay connected? Uh, and can an attacker get in at that time? And now there's just a lot of, it's not a, it's not a, like a prohibitively difficult problem. It's just something that we need to be aware of. If you have authenticated users using WebSockets, just something you got to be aware of is how you authenticate those WebSockets. Uh, just something that, that needs to be handled. I might, even in homework five, I might not even uh, worry about that. And homework five probably won't even have WebSockets. But going back to an earlier question, maybe that'll be the bonus to have uh, authentication on the WebSockets. Uh, uh, what you do have to do on your project, although you'll probably just use a library for that and then explain how the library solves it. Uh, so let's talk about this WebSocket handshake. How do we create a connection? We need to make sure that both client and server are speaking the same protocol because some servers won't support WebSocket connections um, or have them implemented improperly. So we wanna make sure, the browser wants to make sure that the server is speaking the same protocol. So the client's gonna send a request in such a way that the server can only send the proper response if it is speaking WebSockets. Because the browser doesn't want a WebSocket connection to a host that doesn't speak WebSockets because that's just a wasted connection. So there's a protocol here in this, uh, uh, this and the next slide are probably the two most important slides for your homework for objective one. The client is going to send an HTTP GET request for the path of your WebSocket. In the homework, it's that WebSocket. When we have that WebSocket connection line in the JavaScript, that path that we typed was WebSocket. It's not a special path name, it's just whatever I decided to name it. And you'd feel free to change it too if you want. Um, but we make a request for a specific path, in our case, slash WebSocket with all lowercase letters. The client is going to send these very specific headers, a connection header with the value upgrade and an upgrade header with the value WebSocket. This is right from the protocol. You have to have these headers with this exact capitalization. This is what the protocol says. If we receive an upgrade request to WebSockets, if we receive these two headers, that means this is an upgrade request to upgrade to the WebSocket protocol. There will also be a third header, the sec WebSocket key, which is just going to be a random string. This will be different every single time with high probability. And this is a very important value to read. You're gonna respond, your server is going to respond with a 101 switching protocols response, our first 100 level code. We're gonna respond with a 101 switching protocols with the headers connection, upgrade, upgrade WebSockets, identical to what the, uh, what the browser sent and then a sec WebSocket except, which is something. And you have to wait till the next slide to find out what that something is. And let's talk about that right now. So the, the bulk of what you have to do on the server site, like just sending these two headers in the 101 switching protocols, you better be fine with that. Uh, that level of HTTP response we've been doing since homework one, that's all fine. Getting this accept response is going to be the difficult part, or not even difficult, but it's gonna be a little bit of work. So you have to read this random key and generate this accept response using this slide. To generate that response, you're going to read that key that the client sent from that header. You're going to append this very, very, very specific string this is a globally unique ID specific to the WebSocket protocol. This exact string 
is right in the RFC for WebSockets. This is the the ID the that is used for WebSockets. This is um, this is kind of nice in a sense of in one aspect of this course even uh, at least is when you're looking for whatever WebSocket library you end up using for your project, assuming you don't use your homework code for it, uh, whatever library you end up using, when you have to go into that library to write your report, you have to figure out where they're doing the handshake. That's part of what the report is going to request, and we should talk about that maybe uh, maybe after homework five content. We'll talk about that a lot. Um, but when you're trying to find that code, you can search for this very exact specific string in that library and find exactly where they're doing the handshake by looking up this unique ID. But anyway, you take that key, append this string to the key, compute the SHA-1 hash of that string, of the concatenated string, and then convert that to a base 64 using a burst base 64 encoding encode that string the sha1 hash the base 64 encoding so there's two things here sha1 and base 64 this is where you're expected to look up documentation for your specific language and find out how to compute sha1 hashes and how to convert a byte array to a base 64 encoding base 64 is something uh, this is a an encoding that's used to encode any arbitrary bytes, which your SHA-1 hash is going to output. This will output a, a byte array to convert any bytes into ASCII text. Now, that's very useful, and this can be used, like, say you're sending an image and that's not text encoded one thing you can do with those images is take the base 64 encoding of that image convert all those bytes to valid ascii that's what the base 64 encoding does and now any arbitrary bytes can be represented as a string and then sent wherever we need strings and we need to do this here because we're setting a sha1 hash which is going to be a byte array and we're setting that in a header in this this accept header headers can only be ascii http headers can only be ascii we know that from earlier in the semester it can only be ascii but we want to set the value of an http header to a sha1 hash which similar to images does not follow a text encoding much less ascii it's just a bunch of random bytes so we base 64 encode it converts those random bytes to a string, not random, but uh, bytes that don't follow a string protocol into a string. And now we can set that to our header. And then that's your response. You're 101 with the right headers, including the accept that follows this very exact procedure. And then you have a WebSocket connection. Now the browser knows and you know to leave that TCP connection open and whenever you receive information over that WebSocket connection that that is a WebSocket message following the WebSocket frame protocol. When you receive a WebSocket message, this one will go more in depth on, in, on Wednesday. Uh, I'll breeze through it right now. The most important thing for today was the WebSocket handshake is um is going to be a lot of byte manipulation or sorry bit manipulation we are going to get to the bit level on this so we're going to get a message a websocket frame as we say in this format where each bit is going to have a specific meaning and we had to parse this at the bit level and eventually we do get to the byte level once we get to this part we're going to, have to look at the bits of this and then be able to parse the bytes of the payload to get the actual message that's being sent in this WebSocket frame. 
Importantly, you have to remember which connections have been upgraded to WebSocket connections. So when you receive information over those TCP connections, you know, hey, this is, has been upgraded to WebSockets. I need to parse this as a WebSocket frame and not as an HTTP request. If you're getting a frame like this and you're saying, okay, give me the first line, split on spaces, give me the path and the request type, uh, your server is going to be crashing pretty quick as long as you don't have to do it by hand uh, so we're going to need a lot of bitwise manipulation which i assume is something you ha don't have much practice with you have practice at least with it in theory from courses like 191 and 341 which was just mentioned um, but probably not so much in code so uh, i'll do a little bit at least in python and javascript i'll show you how to xor uh, XOR things and how to do a little bit level manipulation, which I think is really fun. I enjoy it. I don't know. Maybe, I, maybe I'm alone in that, but it's, uh, I think it's, it's interesting to see how we're usually so distant from the fact that computers only speak in ones and zeros with web sockets. We're actually going to peel back that layer and say, see, look at very bluntly, everything we work with in a computer is just ones and zeros. Like you learn about how doubles are represented, IEEE formats, for example, but you never really have to care when you're programming, not not to a deep extent, as long as you're not using equal equal to compare doubles, looking at you, anyone in in chat who's in 116. Uh, uh, but beyond that, you don't really have to care. But when we're talking about this stuff, we're actually going to have to care, which I, don't know, I always think is interesting when I can take something I've learned and actually have it matter a little bit so hopefully at least uh, some of you feel the same way and this code we saw in the homework uh, earlier so I want to skip that a little bit and if I if I may we're kind of out of time here but um, but I do want to give I guess I'll go to my own channel I just want to show quickly so when you're doing this handshake, when you're doing objective one, it can be uh, it can be a little tricky to know. It can be tricky to do testing, but luckily there's an easy way to get test cases for your objective one. I strongly, strongly recommend writing test cases for this. Don't test with your browser, for the love of God. Don't test with your browser. You're gonna take forever to get that uh, to get that working. Instead, go to any site that uses WebSockets. Twitch, for example, perfect. Got a, a site that uses, uh, uses WebSockets. And go to your WebSocket request. You can find this by sorting by status and finding the response code of 101 switching protocols. Go to the headers and now, right there, you have a perfect example of a test case. Here's the WebSocket key that the client sent and the valid response, the expected response, your accept. The protocol specifies for a given key, the response is always going to be the same exact thing. It's going to be this with that GUID appended to it, the SHA-1 hash of that, and then base64 encoded. That's what this is going to be. So go to any site that uses WebSockets and you got yourself a test case, just refresh, and you got yourself another test case. <laughs> Once it loads. Modern sites do a lot of stuff, by the way. These things get complex. Uh, once we get this calming down a bit, uh, we can get another test case. This key is going to be different each time. I got two test cases now. Just grab those on this input. I expect this output then write a method or a function that takes a key and returns the proper accept. And by the way, if you go into any WebSocket, you can check the messages. And as soon as, uh, oh, I'm logged in as Botloff. And as soon as someone sends a message in chat, we'll actually see that message show up. And I'm going to sit here and wait for somebody to send a message in chat. Hey, there we go. And and then we get the chat message. We get the message. 
my hero 20 saying hi you can see all the messages so if you want to if you're ever interested or, or you want to generate test cases or uh, you're stumped on the homework and you want to see how things work go to a site that uses websockets go to the websocket connection you can see all the messages going back and forth now we can't see the frames we can't see all the bits we're going to see just the payload but you can still get an idea of how sites are using websockets